This will be our final podcast on the skin and integumentary system. In this podcast, we're going to look at specialized skin accessories and appendages. These would be specializations and modifications, essentially from the stratum basale. Now, there's an invagination of the epidermis at certain sites, and this is going to yield hair follicles and their associated sebaceous glands, as well as eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. Invaginations of the epidermis at the tips of the fingers and toes yield nail beds and nails. In each case, specialized differentiation of the stratum basale and or modification of the keratinization process is the ultimate source of these skin specializations. And as we've said, there are at least 14 different types of keratin. I'm not going to hold you responsible for these. Hard keratins are common in the hair and in the nails, and these hard keratins are highly sulfated. There are various glands associated with the skin, and this is just the diagrammatic view of the skin showing a hair follicle. But we can talk about eccrine sweat glands, which are located over most of the surface of the body. Here's an eccrine sweat gland diagrammatically here. Uh, there are apocrine sweat glands. The apocrine sweat glands are limited to the axillary and pubic areas, and this is showing an apocrine gland here. And note the apocrine gland is emptying into the hair follicle, where the eccrine sweat gland has its own duct to the surface. And then there are sebaceous glands, uh, an example shown here in the diagram. Sebaceous glands are associated with hair follicles, and wherever there are hair follicles over the body, there may be a associated sebaceous glands. An eccrine sweat gland is a simple tubular gland extending from the skin surface into the dermis. The duct portion of the gland is a simple coiled tube that's lined by a double cuboidal epithelium or a stratified cuboidal epithelium. The secretory portion is a coiled tube consisting of two cell types that are not so visible on a histological section, but they are visible at the electron microscopic level. But there's a clear cell and a dark cell. Both of these cells are larger than the duct cells. Now the tube itself is surrounded by a thin layer of myoepithelial cells. These are cells that are rich in actin and myosin. They're modified epithelial cells, and we believe that the contraction of the actin and myosin helps to force the secretory product out of the sweat gland. The secretory product itself is a hypotonic, watery substance that contains small amounts of glycogen that come from the clear cells and glycoprotein that comes from the dark cells. The secretory product also contains salts, urea, uric acid, and ammonia. The mechanism of secretion for the eccrine sweat glands is merocrine. So in one sense, the eccrine glands do function in an excretory manner, kind of in a minor sense, getting rid of salts and urea and some ammonium. But most importantly, the eccrine sweat glands play a major role in the body's temperature regulation. Because you might imagine, as you sweat, you can get a evaporative cooling as the water evaporates. Now, this image is fairly deep between the dermis and hypodermis. You can see a lot of adipose, and oftentimes the secretory components of the eccrine sweat glands are at the junction between the dermis and hypodermis. Here is a, another image of the same thing. So here would be the secretory portions like this and the duct portions consisting of this double cuboidal epithelium. On this image you can see a view of the epidermis itself and then the dermis. So here's part of the duct portion coursing through the dermis. Uh, so this duct portion would have been originating from cells deeper in the dermis and the hypodermis itself. So it's coursing through the dermis. And here you can even see it coming through the stratum corneum and just a higher power view of the duct itself. Apocrine sweat glands are a tubular gland with very dilated secretory components. The duct portion is, is a simple tube consisting of a double cuboidal epithelium. The duct portion itself empties into a hair follicle. Here you can see maybe some profiles of the duct right here. The secretory portion consists of a dilated coil tube. Notice the very large open lumen. There's one cell type, and these cells are also surrounded by myo 
epithelial cells. When activated, the secretory cells accumulate vesicles in their apices prior to secretion, and it seems like these cells have a bleb-like protrusion at the apical surface. That's shown here. The secretory product is rich in proteins, lipids, and pheromones, although we don't know how significant the role of pheromones is in humans, pheromones certainly play an important role in other animals. The mechanism of secretion in these apocrine sweat glands is merocrine, so we need to be careful because we'll talk about apocrine secretion later in the course when we talk about the mammary gland. In an apocrine secretion, there is actually a, a release of a little bit of the apical part of the cytoplasm, and these blebs that you see on the apocrine sweat gland suggest that, but these are actually not released. Secretion in the apocrine glands is indeed merocrine. Now the apocrine sweat glands don't become active until puberty. In females they may show some cyclic changes with the menstrual cycle. Sebaceous glands are sac-like glands that are formed as outgrowths of sheaths of the hair follicles. Here you can see the sebaceous glands like this. The secretory portion consists of stem cells, which are going to divide to yield another stem cell, and a cell which is going to differentiate into a secretory cell. The differentiating cells are going to contain abundant rough ER and smooth ER, and a fairly well-developed Golgi complex. The cell itself is going to fill with the secretory product and then the entire cell is going to burst and the contents are going to be discarded. This is a form of program cell death. The secretory product is an oily product called sebum. So as these cells rupture, the contents are released directly into the hair follicle. Now a hair follicle itself is an invagination of the epidermis into the dermis and this yields a hair bulb which is nourished by a dermal papilla. The hair matrix is a modified stratum basale in which different matrix cells form each portion of the hair shaft. One can define a medulla, which consists of vacuolated cells, a cortex, which consists of keratinized cells, and a cuticle, consisting of very heavily keratinized cells resembling the stratum corneum. It turns out that trichohyalin is a glue-type protein resembling keratohyalin. That binds the keratin fibers together, and that forms the hard keratin of the hair shaft. Hair color is added by melanocytes that are found in the matrix. The external sheath of the follicle is essentially an invagination of the layers of the epidermis, so from the stratum basale and stratum spinosum, you get that sense that it's invaginating. The erectopyle muscle, shown diagrammatically here, consists of bundles of smooth muscle. It's attached to the hair follicle and to the papillary dermis, and on contraction of the erectopyle muscle, the hair will stand on end. Sure, it also causes prickling or goosebumps on human skin. Now it's important to note that in deep skin abrasions there are stem cells from the hair follicle that can regenerate the lost epidermis. These cells have been found to be concentrated in the central or so-called bulge area of the hair shaft that's commonly seen near the sebaceous glands. And so here, just shown diagrammatically, is the sebaceous gland, here's this bulge area. So you might imagine that if there's a severe abrasion and you lose a lot of the epidermal surface, so long as these stem cells are still here, the epidermis can more readily regenerate. Now these histological images show the hair shaft in longitudinal and cross-section, showing the papilla here with the hair bulb. I'm not going to ask you to remember or worry about the different layers in the hair follicle. So you don't have to worry about that at all for an exam. I don't think you'll have any trouble recognizing that these are hair follicles. And then the nail matrix consists of stratum basale and a stratum spinosum. The edges of the nail are abutted on all sides by epidermis, consisting of the usual layers. The stratum corneum overlapping the upper and lower edges of the nail is termed the aponychium and hyponychium, respectively. 
Nails consist of hard plates of keratin that is uh, very sulfur rich. It's compacted. The layers are held together by a keratin hyaline substance. Nails grow relatively rapidly, about a half a millimeter per week, and they slide continuously out over the parallel epidermal ridges of the nail bed. And this just shows the epidermal ridges in the nail bed. Here you can see the nail itself, the nail bed, hyponychium and eponychium. And again, I'm not going to ask you to remember that much about the nails on an exam. Now, there are a variety of sensory receptors in the skin. This just shows what some of them look like diagrammatically. There can be free axon endings in the skin. You can see some Merkel cells in the skin. You can see various capsules, the terminating branches of axons in the skin. The three main receptors that I want you to be aware of are Pacinian corpuscles, which are pressure receptors, Meissner's corpuscles, which are fine touch receptors, and Ruffini's corpuscles, which are actually stretch receptors. We have histological images to show you of the Pacinian and Meissner's corpuscles. It's rather difficult to get histological images of the Ruffini's corpuscles, and we don't have any to show you. Here is some examples of the Pacinian corpuscles. Here they're shown deep down almost to the hypodermis level. Notice they almost have like these concentric rings of Schwann cells that wrap around them. The axon itself is right in the middle. In real life these are fluid filled in their pressure receptors. And then the Meissner's corpuscles, here you can see them in the dermal papillae with a higher power magnification of them here. These are very easy to recognize these two structures histologically. Something that you're going to kind of foreshadow as you go forward into pathology, three main cancers can originate from cells in the epidermis. And these usually occur because of prolonged exposure to UV radiation from the sun. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common form of skin cancer. This arises from the bulge in the outer root sheet of the hair follicle. Basal cell carcinomas are usually very slow growing and they usually don't metastasize. A squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common form of skin cancer. Squamous cell carcinomas develop from small painless nodules or patches on the skin. They're usually surrounded by a small inflamed area. There are atypical keratinocytes in all levels of the epidermis. Sometimes these are called carcinomas in situ when they're within the epidermis itself. If the basal lamina is disrupted, the squamous cell carcinoma can get into the dermis and can metastasize to the lymph nodes, then it becomes more serious. And then the most serious the serious form of skin cancer, especially if not recognized early, is malignant melanoma. These originate from melanocytes, and remember melanocytes are derived from neural crest cells, which by their very nature are migratory. Malignant melanomas will aggregate into nests within the epidermis or they'll scatter throughout the epidermis. They grow relatively rapidly. If the basal lamina gets disrupted, they'll grow into the dermis where they'll rapidly metastasize. Now, there's a clinical mnemonic that people re remember from melanoma. It's called ABCD. A stands for asymmetrical shape of the lesion. So if you've got a, an asymmetrical lesion on the skin, that would be suspicious. If the border of the lesion is irregular, that's very suspicious. If the colors of the lesion vary, that's very suspicious. And if the diameter is larger than six millimeters, that's very suspicious. So a dermatologist or even a primary care physician remembers this ABCD as a way to diagnose the potential for melanomas.